Morning. See a uh, lot of gang colors out there in the crowd this morning. Uh, it is Vikings Packer weekend. If you are joining us online and you're just listening to this message on your way to work somewhere uh, later, not on a Sunday morning, you just need to know I'm looking at several people wearing the wrong colored t-shirt this morning. Um, Interestingly enough, it's not just people here. There's actually people outside these walls flooding the streets of Minneapolis wearing the wrong colors. The, the wrong colors would be the green and gold, uh, just so we're clear on that. Um, and I don't know if they just don't know how to tell time. Like, the, the game doesn't start until 7.30. So I don't know if they just, like, we're just going to wander. And then as we see people entering the stadium, the, the big new doors open up, then we'll know that's our cue to go in. So... Um, one, one of the guys, I actually had somebody send me a picture of one of these Packer fans. And he bears a striking resemblance to Hope's senior pastor. You be the judge. I mean, does that? <laughs> now, to the layman, you might look at this and go, that looks a lot like Steve Treichler. I knew instantly by looking at how much bigger this man's biceps were... <laughs> Then Steve's, that I knew this was just, this was not actually him. Um, I couldn't believe that. David, actually David Treichler, his oldest son, sent me that picture earlier this week. I'm like, wow, that was, that's crazy. Uh, looks a lot like Steve. Now, if you're wondering, you know, come 10.30, 11, 11.30 tonight, why the Vikings did so well, I'm going to give you a little, little heads up, a little... Um, secret here. I had the chance to go and tour the new stadium this past Thursday, and we got to visit the locker room. And because I'm that guy, I had to sit in AP's chair. So <laughs> I'm hoping a little bit of my aura is, is left there. So when he comes in this afternoon to get dressed, he just feels great. He's just like, wow, there's just, there's just something different about this chair. Like, what is that? So if you're wondering why the Vikings win 72-2, to two, uh, that's, that's why, right there. Um, I don't know why they got a safety. Bradford, he ran out of the, I don't know. Weird start. It was a weird start to the game, but we got back on track uh, really quickly. My name's Cor Shemleski. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. September is a month in which a lot of people check out churches. It's just fall, kind of a refresh, a restart. And so I want to introduce myself. Hi to those of uh, you at Hope East worshiping over there. Uh, my story is I grew up, I was born and raised a, a Minnesotan in the north suburbs. I was raised in Shoreview, Minnesota, went to Moundsview High School, grew up in the mean streets of the north suburbs. I grew up going to church, but I didn't have a relationship with God. I didn't know Jesus Christ. And, it, and for me, that's, that's just been my story, and so I don't think it's that odd or weird until this summer I was sharing with some some new friends of ours, we've, we've made friends with some um, baseball families. Our kids play baseball in the summer, and so we get to hang out with some of the other coaches. And uh, I, I had the chance to, to share my story with them. One of the wives said, like, it's, I understand how people become pastors when they're like, their dad was a pastor, their granddad was a pastor, their great-granddad was a pastor, but, but Cor, what's, what's your story, you know? They were surprised when I told them that I had... Um, become a pastor without having a dad or a granddad that was in the ministry. And so my story begins, uh, my, my spiritual journey begins with my oldest brother, Guy, sharing the story of God and the gospel with me when he was a freshman or sophomore at Bethel University. He brought this home to uh, my family as we were kind of gathering for Christmas morning. I mean, I am just eager, like, rip open the presents, let's go, it's time, and he is dawdling Christmas morning, but he's not like sleeping in, he's on the computer. And I'm like, dude, what, what can be so important that you're on the computer this morning? Well, he wanted to print off a note of how God had worked in his life, and he wanted to share this newfound faith with his family. At that time... I was not ready to hear everything that God was doing in his life because I was ready to hear what I got for Christmas. So he tried to share a little bit about his faith, what God was doing in his life, the story of Jesus Christ, kind of what Christmas is about. And I was like, yeah, I want presents. I want stuff. And I had gotten him a nice shirt 
and he ended up getting me a Christian book. And I didn't think that that was kind of comparable uh, in my mind. And, and so I, I put that book on the shelf, and it wasn't until three to four years later that I went to the University of Minnesota, and my life got turned upside down. I had uh, joined the football team and then quit the football team. I had started off as in chemical engineering because they make a ton of money, and then I wasn't in chemical engineering because it was too hard. And then I went to civil engineering because I'm like, it's buildings, it's uh, bridges, yeah. And then I was like, no, that's still too hard. <laughs> so I settled in mathematics thinking I was going to be a, a math teacher and football coach the rest of my life. Would have loved doing that, but God had other plans. And so when life was falling apart at the end of my freshman year, I was open. I was spiritually open. I, I actually remember praying on my bed one night in uh, Centennial Hall, like, God, if if you're real, I need you to show up. I need to see that you give a rip about what's happening in my life because I, I believe my life was falling apart. And so I just prayed, and, and God, God showed up. God answered my prayer. He sent a guy, a guy by the name of Vince Johnson, who was a part of a, a student ministry on campus, came to talk to me about God. I mean, this was within 48 hours of the time I prayed. I was like, God, if you're real, show up. This was April. Nobody goes looking for new friends in April, but Vince was looking for new friends. And so Vince called me and says, hey, do you want to get together and talk about God? And I was like, wow, God answers prayer. I can't believe it. God heard me and answered prayer. Why did I not pray for a car? That would have been so great. And so Vince came, and he brought with him, as he came into my dorm room, he brought God. He shared the good news of Jesus Christ with me. He brought God into my dorm room that day, and when Vince left, God stayed. And my life has never been the same since. And I've had the opportunity now for 12 years to pastor, to preach, and to teach, and I'm enthusiastic about today's message because it is the heart of the gospel. It's not the greatest good. The greatest good of the gospel is God. We get God, okay? But, but the heart of the gospel is this, this idea of God doing something that we couldn't do for ourselves. And that's what my brother was trying to talk to me about. It's what Vince shared with me, and it's my joy to share a little bit of this with you today. So we are in the gospel of Luke this morning. We're nearing the end, and I want to just highlight briefly, okay, so, so Jesus is born. We celebrate that around Christmas. That's the incarnation. He is raised. He has a public ministry in which he teaches about God and his ways, and many times that came against the religious traditions and what the priests and the teachers of the law were bringing about. They had traditions and commandments that we don't find in our Bible. It was just added to and so Jesus was undoing some of their own traditions and laws that they had created. And as a result, he found himself being opposed by these leaders. And that's where we've been. That's where we've been for a couple weeks now. He went before the religious leaders. They say, this is not okay. You're blaspheming God. We want to uh, kill you. But they don't have the authority to do that, so they bring him before political leaders. Last week we looked at Herod. This week we're going to finish the second half of when Jesus is brought before Pilate, who does have authority to bring forth capital punishment. And so if you want to open your Bibles, we're in Luke 23. I put a sermon insert in your worship folder. It's a great place to follow along. Uh, the headings in my PowerPoint match the headings in there, so uh, you can track along just uh, fine there. I am going to do things a little bit in reverse order. Typically, how I like to go is, hey, let's look through the Bible, let's read the passage, let's um, understand it, and then let's, let's look at some of the biblical principles, the theological convictions that come out of that. I'm actually going to swap those for today. I want to start with this idea um, this theological topic that I'm calling the heart of the gospel, okay? And then we'll see how that's actually experienced in the story from Luke's account, okay? So I'm going to reverse those a little bit, going to preach in, in reverse. It's not how I'm accustomed to do it. I like to go Bible and then unpack, but we're going to unpack first and then catch up to the Bible, uh, the Bible story in a little bit. We still have uh, other, other passages, other Bible passages. So what, when, I, when I talk about one of the most critical doctrines in Christianity, what am I talking about, Okay? I want to look at what's called substitutionary atonement or vicarious atonement or penal substitution. You might read, depending on the book that you read, 
depending on their background, depending on what systematic theology book you're looking at, it could be any one of these names. Okay? So all of these are, are similar in what, what I'm talking about here. Okay, So substitutionary atonement, substitutionary just means sub, substitute. Okay, Atonement means covering. Covering over. In this case, we're talking about covering over sin. Vicarious. Vicarious atonement. One who stands in the place of. They actually use this in Anglican churches. There's like vicars. You get to stand in, in place of God. It's like, well, that's, I don't know if that comes with, you know, the pastor title. I should be looking for a pay, pay increase here with vicar. I could become a vicar uh, in the Anglican church. Uh, I don't want to become a vicar. Um, or penal substitution. Penal meaning penalty. Penalty. There's a penalty that needs um, to be brought forth. Why? Because of sin. The belief is that sin comes against God's holiness, comes against his righteousness, and therefore it needs to be atoned for. It needs to be covered over. It needs to be made up for. And this, this particular one, this idea of penal substitution, has really lost favor in a lot of circles because people have moved away from the idea that God has justice and wrath against sin. Okay, so this is growing, there is a, a growing number of Christians that are disenchanted with this belief because they don't want to believe that God comes against sin, that, God, that, that somehow God comes against uh, sin through penalty, through punishment, through wrath. And I just, even in my own uh, Facebook feed, uh, there's a, a, a guy and he just seems to be more of that mindset. He was under the belief, no, there is, there is penal substitution, and then over the last few years, you're just like, don't believe that anymore. At Hope, we believe that God's holiness is preserved through the belief, no, there is penalty for sin. We can't slap a holy God in the face and just wake up the next morning as if nothing happened. No, there's, that's, there's something wrong with that. God's holiness demands a response. To this kind of aversion to penal substitution, Niebuhr, a guy named, by the name of Richard Niebuhr in 1937, saw this kind of happening. And, and just so you know, Niebuhr is not conservative or liberal. He just made all kinds of people mad, and I think that's why I like him. Uh, okay? But this is kind of going against the, the liberal mindset that he saw in 1937. Okay? How he saw the gospel being presented. Let me read for you. It says, that the gospel is a, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. And so Niebuhr says, I, I just can't believe that. Now, he had some things to say against conservative thinking. He really believes conservative churches were too inward. They needed to push outward into the city, outward into their communities. But he also couldn't handle what he was seeing with the liberal message of the Bible, which he's representing here. He's seeing too much of this presentation of a God without wrath bringing forth people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a cross, of a Christ without a cross. And it's why we cling to the cross. Because we do believe in God's holiness and righteousness. That's why the cross is precious. It's why, why the sacrifice of Jesus is so compelling to us now, where do we go in the Bible for this? I want to bring forth a few Bible passages that speak to this issue, the need for penal substitution or vicarious atonement or substitutionary atonement. Let me draw your attention to Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Again, unpacking it, we're going to show you where this is seen in today's Lucan passage. Let me just read from Galatians chapter 3. It's spoken, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. 
So a couple things from this passage. In the midst of a God who is absolute holiness, we see that and we think, okay, now we need to be holy. And some of us are misguided and actually believe we're living a holy life. Another group of us rightly realize, I tried, God, and it's not working. And that was me as a freshman at the University of Minnesota. I tried, it's not working. I tried to live life, and it's not happening. I even tried to do good things, and it wasn't bringing forth a filled life. And he says, yeah, if you rely on observing the law, you're going to curse. It's not going to happen that way. You're not going to have life in God through your own obedience, through your own holiness, In verse 11, he says, no one is justified this way before God. Doing it yourself, going your own way, trying to pave your own path to God. Nobody's justified through that means. Nobody's made right. Nobody's atoned for in your own attempts. So what is it then? Well, the righteous live by faith. Faith how? Faith in whom? Faith in what? Faith in Christ and in the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's where I want to highlight verse 13 here. Christ redeemed us from the curse. So, Let's, let's just journey back in time here. God creates all things, Genesis 1 and 2, perfectly, without sin. Genesis 3, sin enters the world, and through sin, death enters the world. That's why if you're living life and it's not making sense, it's because sin has entered the world and death through sin. Your sin, my sin, other people's sin. And now Christ has come to redeem, to purchase back, to atone, to be a substitute, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And this is an Old Testament passage, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So it begs the question, how is Christ bear the curse, make penalty for sin? How does he do that? I want to grab onto a quote from Tim Keller. I think it's instructive here for us. He says, this means God treated Jesus as if he was an absolutely evil person. He didn't just get cursed, he became the curse. God treated him as if he was evil itself. Where's the good news come forth? Well, keep reading. On the other hand, it must mean the minute you become a Christian, you don't just get forgiveness, you get treated as if you were Jesus. Jesus was treated as if he was you, you're treated as if you were him. And there we see substitution. Jesus takes our life upon himself. We receive his life in return. Let me jump to another passage that helps us understand this idea of substitutionary atonement, vicarious atonement. In 1 Peter 2, we read, He committed no sin, Jesus, committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judged justly, judges justly. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Now granted, for some of you, you hear about substitutionary atonement, boom, you love it. You've, you've heard this message. For some of you, this might be the first time you've ever heard this message. That Jesus Christ gave his life for you. Substituted his life for you. It was new to me as a freshman in college. It might be new to you, but think of this. That Jesus suffered. Jesus went to the cross on your behalf. I want to give you just a little mental imagery of what that suffering, okay? We, We already see that he became a curse for us and what that meant. Let's just tease out a little bit more. What does it mean that he suffered for us? And by extension, how we were saved from similar suffering if he was our substitute. Keller again says this, when it says he suffered for us, it must mean he experienced in his heart what we would have experienced in hell forever and ever, having lost God. He turned to the Father, and where the Father had been, there was nothing. The Father rejected him. The Father cursed him. We sing a hymn that says the Father turns his face away. Why? Because Jesus became sin for us. So 
So imagine the heartbreak in God the Son, Jesus Christ, who to this moment, prior to the cross, has had intimate, personal, moment-by-moment fellowship with his Father, walking together through life, talking with one another. Jesus says that the words that were coming forth from him, he heard from his Father. And the things that he did, he did because he saw the Father doing them. Intimate conversation. And then this moment of hanging on a cross, paying for our sin, receiving our penalty, suffering for us. He looks to the Father for strength. He doesn't see the Father. The Father rejects him. The Father cursed him. Jesus Christ himself bore our sins. So what does that mean for us? Okay, we've hit a little bit of what this meant for Jesus, which does not sound good. So what does that mean for us? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. The passage from 1 Peter says, by his wounds you have been healed. What does that mean? What does that look like? Charles Spurgeon summarizes it this way. Whatever sins a believer has ever committed or ever will commit, Christ bore them on the tree. Sins original and sins natural. Sins actual and practical. Sins of thought and word and deed. Heinous sins, blasphemies, uncleanliness, Uh, Those that are thought to be minor sins, like evil imaginations, hasty words. I will not go on with the list, for time would fail me to get to the end of it. But when you have mentioned all the sins you can think of, I can still say that the text covers them all. Who his own self bear our sins, or as we updated it here, he himself bore our sins in his body. Not some of them. Not the greater ones. Not the lesser ones, to the exclusion of the greater But all our sins, Jesus Christ bore all our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds, you and I are healed. So yes, we believe in substitutionary atonement, vicarious atonement, penal substitution. Jesus receiving the penalty, Jesus becoming a curse for us. Jesus having the Father turn his face away. Why? Because Jesus was looked upon as sin itself, as evil itself. And how great the news that somehow in God's wisdom, in God's planning, in God's love, that he would actually accept us, receive us, that the Father would turn away from Christ and look upon us and say, you now are a part of my family as sons and daughters. Perhaps there's no verse in the Bible that so summarizes what I'm trying to talk about then. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We believe in the message We believe the Bible brings forth this this idea of substitution. One substituting themselves for the other. We see this depicted as early as Abraham and Isaac. If you remember that Old Testament story, we see there an idea of substitution that, that Abraham was called to sacrifice his son and at the last moment there's a substitute, a ram that's brought forth. We see it in Leviticus, all these Old Testament laws and sacrifices, right? Okay, if you sin this way, bring this sacrificial animal offering. If you bring, you know, this sin against God, then there's a different animal offering. And just all of that paving the way for a once-for-all Lamb of God sacrifice. Jesus. And so this idea of substitute is throughout the Scriptures. I've given you a couple New Testament passages to highlight the importance of this. as the heart of the Gospel. John Stott, who wrote... The book on it, The Cross of Christ, says this. The concept of substitution may be said, then, to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man, and again, this is just people, just 
uh, man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God alone. God accepts penalties which belong to man alone, to people alone. All of that, all of that, as vital, as paramount to our faith, to our salvation, but also as as a precursor to today's passage in Luke's gospel. Let me read now, beginning in Luke 23, verse 13. Okay? I'm going to read and then I'll make some comments for us here. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appeared to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. The one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. Let's walk through this now, making a couple comments as we go. This first few verses I labeled the second declaration of innocence. Why? Because uh, last week we talked about the first declaration of innocence. If you remember, Jesus is paraded before Pilate. Pilate talks to him, questions him, and says, I don't find any basis for this charge. But then he realizes, oh, this guy's from Herod's area, so then he sends him off to Herod, hoping that maybe Herod has some insight into the Jewish ways and customs that he, as a Roman official, might not have. Herod examines him, no, seems good, sends him back, all right? So now he's in front of Pilate a second time. Pilate examines him again, says, this guy's innocent. This guy hasn't done anything wrong. And so that's why I called this his second declaration of innocence, as just as you're reading verses 13 to 16. If you get to verse 17, your Bible might not have a verse 17. There is probably going to be a footnote in there in your Bible. Why? Uh, some translations will, will cite that, hey, there's this ancient custom where they give a different prisoner, like it's just a feast, it's the Passover time, and so as a ministry to the to the Jews, they like to forgive and be merciful, and so there's this custom where they release one prisoner. It's not really highly attested in Luke's gospel, but we can get there very, very easily from one of the other gospel accounts. That's why your Bible might have a footnote and therefore no verse 17. So just pack that in the back of your brain. Um, there's this custom where a prisoner is released. So, all right, let's jump over to verse 18 here. Um, it says, but the whole crowd shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. And then it gives us this parenthetical comment. Hey, who's that guy? We haven't seen him in the Bible. Oh, he's just a murderer, stirring up dissension in the city, kind of bringing this insurrection, rebellion against uh, those in power and authority. You know, that guy, probably a little bit notorious, okay? So release, they want Barabbas released to them. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him. Isn't it interesting, isn't it a a little bit ironic here that Jesus in the uh, angelic pronouncement at Christmas time, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. (laughs) And now they are calling out for the release, not of Jesus who was brought to bring forth peace, but a murderer, an insurrectionist. Jesus is rejected in favor of Barabbas. 
Going forward in our story, it says, For the third time, Pilate spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. No grounds for this capital punishment. Pilate, trying to have it both ways, says, Here, here's what I'll do. I will have him punished and then release him. That's interesting, right? I find this man not guilty, so I'm just going to do a light beating. I'm going to do something uh, not too extreme, but just enough so it's a, like a stern warning, like Jesus stop stirring up the crowds, right? And this middle road doesn't get him far because they're not going to allow for it. They're not going to allow for Jesus to have a light beating, but this, this is also the pattern if you fast forward into the book of Acts that the disciples experience, right? They're like preaching in Jesus' name. They're brought before the rulers. They're like, okay, we're going to beat you and send you away. And then they, they count it in honor, right? They, we so resembled Jesus in our teaching and ministry that we got beat, just like he did, you know? And it's a badge of honor for them. Pilate is trying to bring about peace rather than justice. And so he, has, he wants to have Jesus just beaten, punished, and then released. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their request. Now, granting their request is different, fundamentally different, than saying, Jesus, you are guilty. Luke, the author, has gone to great lengths to communicate to the modern reader, hey, this guy was innocent. This guy was innocent, even as he went before the religious leaders. Herod declared him innocent once. Pilate declared him innocent three times. So Luke has gone to great lengths to communicate this man's uh, innocence, and yet Pilate is willing. Pilate decides to grant their demand. In verse, four, uh, verse 25 here, it says, Pilate released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. Pilate released Barabbas, the one they had asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. I want to take a moment right here, because I think this is, this is for me the most emotional part of this passage, this idea of, of Jesus being given over to crucifixion and the murder, insurrection leading, rebellion leading Barabbas is set free. For me, this is just, this is emotional, but I think it comes back to Barabbas' experience, experience with this idea of atonement, of substitute, okay? Get yourself into the place of Barabbas, into his heart, into his mindset. He's a murderer. He's leading insurrection. The appropriate penalty for that is capital punishment according to Roman law. So he would rightly be crucified, he would rightly be in the middle of the, of the two criminals uh, at Golgotha. That, that's rightly reserved for Barabbas. And I just imagine him sitting in his cell awaiting his fate. He's guilty, beyond a shadow of a doubt. He's guilty. A couple different times, Scripture just says, murder, leading a rebellion inciting an insurrection against the authorities. And so when he from his cell hears the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him, who do you think he thinks they're talking about? Not Jesus, him. The bloodthirsty crowds are calling out for him to be crucified. And so he awaits his fate in that cell. Might even, you know, just imagine the guard's going to retrieve him. I don't know, in my mind's eye, I, I just imagine the dangling of some keys, you know. And he hears that, and he's just, this is it. This is it. And then the guard comes and says, Barabbas, this is it. This is it. You're free. You're free to go. Imagine the confusion. Imagine how confounded, what, what are you talking about? I'm free to go. 
You're free. No double jeopardy. No more charges against you. You're free. You're saved. Substitution. Atonement. Jesus Christ sacrifices himself in place of Barabbas. And you might be thinking, I'm pushing this too far, that the theological idea of substitutionary atonement and this weird happenstance where Barabbas was supposed to be crucified, but then Jesus crucified, I I might be drawn too strong of a link in your mind. It's interesting to note that Barabbas, a.k.a., also known as, what does his name mean? Son of the Father. So on that day, a son of a father was going to get crucified. At the start of the day, it was going to be one son of the father, Barabbas, and it ended up being, at the end of the day, the son of the heavenly father. Barabbas experienced substitutionary atonement. Vicarious. One stood in his place. Paid the penalty that he should have rightly paid. And that has all sorts of theological, relational implications for you and me. How so? Let me go back to 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For Barabbas, God made Jesus, who had no sin, no reason to be crucified. Crucified. So that in Christ, Barabbas might experience the freedom of God. Now what about you and me? God made Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Just start inserting sin struggles right here. What what are you struggling with? What is it in your life that causes you to slap God in the face and go the other way? God made him, who had no sin, who had no lust, To be lust for us so that in him we might become the purity of God. That God would look on us and see the holiness of Jesus. God made him who had no pride to be pride for us so that in him we might become the humility of God. That God looks upon us and sees the humility and gentleness of his son. God made him who had no hostility toward the Father, to be hostility toward the Father, so that in him we might become the peace of God. We have peace with our Father. He made him who had no darkness to become darkness for us, so that in him we might experience the light of God. God made Jesus, who had no death, no death in him, to become death for us, so that in him we might become the life of God. What do we do with that? What do we do with this idea of of Jesus Christ substituting himself for us? This idea of vicarious, to, to experience what Barabbas experienced. How should he then go live? What do we do with that? Let me take one just right from this passage and then one from a different passage. First one. Be reconciled to God. Verse 20, which precedes verse 21. It was in math. I did mathematics as an undergrad, so 20 comes before 21. Uh, What comes right before this? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why? Because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Be reconciled to God. If you are here and you're hearing this for the first time, be reconciled to God. If you're here and you're wrestling through the claims of Christianity and what the Bible says about the cross and about salvation, be reconciled to God. You might have questions. You might have struggles. You might have things that have happened in your life that cause you to wonder about God's love. And yet, this idea, those verses, are as plain and simple enough for a five-year-old to receive and to believe in God's salvation. Some of you, maybe you don't have my story of accepting Christ at 19. You have a story of accepting Christ at 5. How can you do that? How can you possibly? You're far too, uh, t- too little. You don't have enough intelligence. No, no. This is as plain and simple enough for any 5-year-old to receive. 
be reconciled to God. Jesus is your substitute. His life for yours, your life for his. As a Midwesterner, that's as fully frontal as an appeal I can make. And yet I want to go politely, go one step further. And so I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon. He's more East Coast. Far East Coast, all the way over to England. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, uh, let me quote him. If you're, if you're thinking about these claims, you've not been reconciled to God, consider these words. How many of you are thus saved? You've made this declaration that you believe in Christ. May the, may the, may the heart-searching Spirit of God go from soul to soul and constrain you to give a true answer. And if you cannot reply in the way we wish, give the other answer and say, I do not know that Christ did bear my sins. When you get home, write that down and look at it. I am not trusting in Christ. I have no part nor, nor lot in him. My sin is pressing upon me, but I have no saving interest in Christ. I think that if you were to write that down legibly with pen and ink and then sit down a little while and think it over, it might be much more useful to you than any word of mine. Current preacher included it. No, sir, you say. I should not like to write that. But surely you may write what is true, Spurgeon says. A man or woman ought not to be afraid to know the truth about his or her spiritual state, nor yet to write it for their own eyes to see. I do not ask you to print it in the newspaper or in a book or post it online, but just to put it down for your own information. Oh, may God grant that you may see your true condition and feel it and not rest until you can say, now I have believed and I know that Christ, his own self, bore my sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross. Be reconciled to God. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for you, to be sin for you, so that in him you might become the righteousness of God. Some of you have been reconciled to God. You've, you've made that commitment. You've turned your heart and your life over to Christ. What for you? Let me give you an encouragement from 1 Peter 3.18. You're going to see substitution in this, but you're also going to see your application for this week. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. There it is, substitution, to bring you to God. There's your application. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, be reconciled to God. And you're saying, I am. And the application is, you get God. The heart of the gospel is substitutionary atonement. Jesus Christ paying a penalty, bearing the curse on the cross, receiving, standing in your place. That's the heart of the gospel. But what do you get as a result of that? You get God. That's the prize. That's the greatest good. Let me quote a guy. Everything else in the gospel is meant to display God's glory and remove every obstacle in him, such as God's wrath, and in us, such as our rebellion, so that we can enjoy God forever. God is the gospel. That is, he is what makes the good news good. Nothing less can make the gospel good news. God is the final and the highest gift that makes the good news good. Until people use the gospel to get to God, they use it wrongly. Christian, if you've been reconciled to God, don't use the gospel improperly. The gospel brings you to God. Now make it your daily effort to find satisfaction in him and him alone. Let him be your everything. That was the confession you made when you were reconciled to God the first time. God, you're my everything. Is there anything vying for the attention of your heart? Anything wooing you away? Anything calling out and saying, this is good, this is good too, this is good enough, this is pretty good. Let God be your joy, your hope, your strength, your stay. 
We're going to sing a couple more songs here, and I just want to have these questions reverberating in your mind. Are you reconciled to God? If not, why not? What's keeping you? You have enough, just in today's Bible passages, to make a commitment to Christ. You have enough. Is it everything that you could know? Of course not. But you have plenty to make a decision to commit your life to God. Be reconciled. And if you have been reconciled, are you rejoicing? Are you living? Are you satisfied? Are you just, are you so excited that because of the gospel you get God? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the gift of your word which teaches us about your ways. And God, there are a number of people that will reject this idea of substitution, of vicarious atonement. But God, not this church. We proclaim we need Christ. We need Christ as our sin bearer. We need Christ to absorb the penalty, to absorb the wrath to be a curse for us so that in him we might experience your righteousness, your forgiveness, your grace, your acceptance. God, for those in this room, for those next door, for those that might be listening to this later on, I pray for them that they would be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to you through your son. As Spurgeon was quoted Spirit, go from soul to soul, searching for honesty, forthrightness. We can't hide before you, God. So let us give a plain and clear answer. Where are we at with you? God, for those who recognize that they are opposed to you, they don't have an interest in you, I pray that they would humble themselves before your cross, your gospel, and they'd be reconciled to you this morning. And God, for that group that has been reconciled to you, that they would not forsake their first love, that they would not turn to the left or to the right, but they would follow the narrow road and the path you've given them, not straying, not wandering off to sin, but be reconciled and to enjoy that relationship with you. God, I pray for them. If there's been any wandering, any willingness to entertain sin, any desire for idols to enter heart and mind and body, that they'd refresh themselves in your gospel. They'd rekindle the relationship with you this morning, God. God, be glorified. Be glorified in the sacrifice of your son, who is our atonement, our substitute. We praise him. In Jesus' name, amen.